a lot of this work that, that I do isn't, isn't done alone, okay? Um, this is, these are community problems that I'm dealing with. I'm a medical veterinary entomologist, so I study mosquitoes, ticks, and flies, things that, affect, things that affect you and your animals. And so if I don't hear about them, I can't help. And that doesn't mean to call my phone right away, um, but what it does mean is that this has been a hugely collaborative project. Um, my career has been hugely collaborative, um, and that, may, that might have stemmed from the soccer field. Um, but for this talk in particular, this academic and government partnership that has been largely unfunded and put together um, kind of off of F&A and like dollars that you kind of just like scooch around and try to figure out um, has really helped. Um, collaborations include with the Tennessee Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Knox County Health Department, uh, multiple departments just on UT's campus and across disciplines too, so veterinary medicine, food science and mathematics. Um, and then the number of students who are willing to tackle, you know, the, the task of getting potentially bit by mosquitoes that are infected with different things is pretty fantastic. And I'm not going to lie, um, Dave Paulson, uh, my technician, um, is probably the unsung hero um, that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, he, he's the guy who knows where to go to get mosquitoes. He's the guy who um, can find these patterns um, and has really been a large part of this project. And um, with that, I just kind of want to talk about really briefly about two mosquito-borne diseases that are, are fairly common in Tennessee, and those are West Nile virus and lacrosse encephalitis. So this graph starts all the way back in 1964 because that's when lacrosse virus was first identified um, in the U.S., and that was um, lacrosse, Wisconsin, which is what it's named after. Um, you can see as we move across the timeline that we actually had lacrosse in Tennessee before we had West Nile virus in Tennessee, but we still I mean, how many of you, I, I mean, hopefully I've been doing a good job of, you know, talking with the media, have heard of lacrosse encephalitis? Okay, more than normal, <laughs> and some of it might be, be lucky um, on my part. Um, but I also want to recognize the research of my predecessor, Dr. Reed Gerhardt, um, within the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. You know, Reed, Reed was a veterinary entomologist, and when lacrosse hit in 1997 in Tennessee, him and Dave pretty much refocused what they were doing, and they stopped and started really working on this project. Um, so a lot of the work between um, 97 and 2012, when I arrived, um, was done by Reed and Dave. Um, when I mention about things happening that kind of refocus you, sometimes it's not a good thing when these happen. Um, and unfortunately, something happened in 2012 that rocked my research program, to, to put it um, very bluntly. Um, this child um, from Maynardville, um, Tennessee, up in Union County, um, passed away um, from lacrosse encephalitis. Lacrosse encephalitis is very rarely fatal, but if things can go undetected for a while, you know, a, a person's immune system responds differently. And so I, like Reed, had to kind of step back, take the day off when I heard about it, um, and then come back in and, and regroup and get to work. And so I'm very happy to be invited here. I'm very thankful um, to come here because my research program is completely dependent upon the community, um, the impact of my program, right? So the goal is no cases of lacrosse. We keep getting cases of lacrosse. I'm not doing my job. Um, so hopefully today I can educate y'all and you know those who are watching online. Um, I would like to share with you the research that we've been doing um, here at UT. And largely the past few years have been dedicated at improving surveillance efforts by developing new tools and honing in on those tools. And then I would like to talk about the next step. So kind of my, you know, I, and maybe this comes from soccer or just, you know, I'm, I'm a goal setter, okay? So I have a two-year goal, I have a five-year goal, I have a 10-year goal, and you know, I have, I have goals that go on. And so the next step is, you know, figuring out why Southern Appalachia and then how do we stop it? Um, because I teach and because I have a, a young child, I recognize things happen. You might get a text message, you might get a phone call. So I always have this on the side so you can come back to know where we are. And so. This is kind of like my outline that you'll be able to watch. So to just give you guys some background on lacrosse encephalitis, it was first identified up in lacrosse, um, Wisconsin. Um, it is still the leading cause of arboviral encephalitis in U.S. children. So encephalitis is, is basically brain swelling. So it, it, it's not a good thing. Um, the epidemiology of this virus is that it basically affects 
white males under 15. So these are kids, okay? These are kids. Symptoms vary like most symptoms do, um, from fever to headache, nausea, and or vomiting. And if you get bit by one of these mosquitoes um, during the summertime, it's typically identified as a summertime illness. I'm not gonna lie, during the summer when my child um, comes down with one of these symptoms, I'm watching very, <laughs> and it's one of those things where like knowing might be too much, but I, I'm watching and I'm watching for this because this is when things get really bad and when um, parents <coughs> typically take their, their child to the hospital. When a child presents with seizures, coma, um, the encephalitis, the hemipriasis, paralysis occurs and then potentially cognitive disorders that last for a lifetime. And this isn't something small. So I've spoken with a number of parents who've heard about the research. They've contacted me and they've said things like, my child has been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I've worked at one house where a parent um, at the time the child was 11 when he was diagnosed, he's probably now 18, but at the time he was 16, and he was going to try to get his learning permit, but he couldn't um, keep the cognitive awareness together, so he's going to be dependent upon his family for, for at least transportation. Um, and so when you think about this, you know, we talk about the individual who's affected, but this becomes a family problem and also a community problem. Yeah? You're saying this disease causes permanent change in damage. It, it, it appears that way. Yeah, and we, we don't know why. I'm going to argue that this is probably a very understudied um, system. Um, and it's probably due to a number of reasons why it's understudied. Um, but just on average, so the range of, so th there have been studies looked at how much money people spend on health costs and so because we live in a time where dollars speak and they really do a family can spend anywhere from fifty thousand dollars on a case to upwards of three million dollars on a case so when you think about it this is a, a, a family member who you're going to not go to work so you lose time from working you're driving into the hospital to stay with them it gets expensive and if this child you know keeps the cognitive um, disorders it can cost a family quite a bit of money over an average lifetime, you know, assuming the 90, you know, 89.6 years was what the paper said. Your key there, the high, low, what is that? High, low, low, high, et cetera. So this, these are where the um, different cases have been identified. So where it's red is where a majority of cases are, where it's blue, it, it's fewer cases occur. So what's the high, high? Low? High chance, high chance, high risk, high okay. observing, yeah. And I'll get to that, I think, here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but so what I just kind of want to show you here, so this um, graph starts earlier in 97, um, is the change in the epidemiology of lacrosse encephalitis across the U.S. So lacrosse is only found in four areas of the world, four areas of, happen to be within the U.S., and one of those areas happens to be southern Appalachia. And so if this is the number of cases and this is time, what you can see the number of cases in southern Appalachia have really kind of started to take over those other cases from where it used to just be in the upper Midwest, but now we're finding um, in Appalachia. If you combine northern and southern Appalachia, it's a majority of the cases. So this is a mosquito-borne virus, which I mentioned earlier, and as the title of the talk. This is Aedes triceriatus, the eastern tree hole mosquito. Um, because of the way I talk, I will go back and forth on this, and I'm, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but Aedes triceriatus, AT, AT trail, Appalachia is a nice way for you to remember that, an eastern tree hole mosquito. This mosquito prefers to feed on little skirts. So those are your chipmunks and your squirrels that you see running around um, with sharp claws and nails, to be honest. Um, they can pass the virus zoonotically this way, and it can also pass the virus transoverally. So there's a number of mosquito-borne pathogens that cannot do this. But what this one can do is if a female is infected, she can pass the virus to her offspring. This does not happen with West Nile virus. This does not happen with the malaria. It's transoverial. If we have a male mosquito that becomes infected from um, transoverial transmission, that male can emerge as an adult and then pass it venereally to a female. So we have venereal transmission too. So again, this doesn't happen with West Nile. This is a very complicated problem um, in that sense and a very interesting problem and a great way to explain all the different types of transmission that mosquitoes can do. 
So again, this little eastern tree hole mosquito um, prefers to lay her eggs in tree holes, which is why she has that name, which we might have one or two um, around campus, and feeds on our little reservoirs that run up and down trees. Okay, so we have a nice system that's been closed for a long time, potentially in, in Appalachia. So I wanna bring your attention back to this graph. It starts back in the early 90s and basically just shows that the prevalence of cases, the frequency of cases, has really changed to where a majority of them are occurring in, in southern Appalachia. So that includes Tennessee, eastern Tennessee, and western North Carolina. And this might be due to the accidental introduction of two invasive mosquitoes. So in 1997 was the first um, collection of um, the Asian tiger mosquito Aedes albopictus in Tennessee. In 1999, Dr. Gearhart was able to identify lacrosse virus from this mosquito. Later, in 2003, um, a second um, potential vector and, an, and invasive mosquito was collected in Tennessee. This is Aedes japonicus, the Asian bush mosquito. And so here is where a lot of us are talking about if these two invasive mosquitoes have really changed the, the epidemiology of lacrosse virus. And it's likely that they not only changed the epidemiology, but it's likely altered the ecology of what's happening here. Because we have these three mosquito species, which will lay eggs together in tree hole mosquitoes and opportunistically use tires. Please, please don't leave tires around, okay? Um, they hold water. You can see it right here. And there are mosquito larvae in there that I found. Um, and they'll also feed on the, on the same scarid reservoirs um, where the virus will replicate. Unfortunately, this location is, is kind of perfect for our, our urban backyards um, and our you know, suburban and rural backyards. Um, I will say that these mosquitoes don't really lay their eggs um, in ground dents or in pools. So a lot of people talk to me about pools. And we've done a great job talking to the public about treating pools for West Nile virus. This is a completely different mosquito, so we don't really have to worry about pools for this mosquito group. But we do get to worry about everything else around your house, and I mean everything else. I'm looking around here and I'm seeing cups. I'm seeing a blue lid on that, um, on your water bottle. That, do you see that blue lid? Will you hold that up? Maybe. That blue lid can grow a mosquito if water gets in there and an egg gets in there. I didn't believe it when I was a grad student. I tested it, it worked. That paper plate, that um, styrofoam container, the recycling, the, yeah, almost everything. So trash is likely, trash. <laughs> we're talking about that now. <laughs> um, open trash bins um, definitely hold water. Um, clogged rain gutters, um, fountains and bird baths, um, tires, so tire, tire swings. I tell everybody to drill a hole in their tire swing. Wagons and other toys. Um, Dave has some cats that he leaves water bowls out for. And it's nice for us because he, it's a great place for um, the Asian bush mosquito to oviposit. So he brings them in for the lab to re replenish our, our colonies. Um, but so we have this. And so this image, I would argue, is not East Tennessee. This image is someplace else. But we have in East Tennessee, I mean, who has just one tree in their yard? Um, I, know, I know in my neighborhood, we don't have just one tree. Um, these trees are everywhere. So we have squirrels running around, chipmunks running up and down, and mosquitoes everywhere. It's kind of where I'd like to get at it. But then I want to get back to the reality of this. You know, this isn't just an ecology problem, this is a health problem. And this, again, did rock my uh, research program. Um, so um, just to kind of go back to this child, um, on July 11th, he presented to the hospital um, with already having two seizures. On the 13th, while at the hospital, his symptoms worsened. On the 14th, he was slightly responsive, but he was only responsive to extreme pain. Okay, so he really wasn't doing well. On the 15th, he had his next seizure, and then he became unresponsive. And on the 16th, um, the six-year-old boy um, from Maynardville passed away from La Crosse encephalitis. He was the fourth fatality at that time. Um, the autopsy um, confirmed that I mean, the fact that his family allowed for an aut autopsy to occur is pretty amazing. Um, and it did confirm that there was lacrosse virus in Tennessee. And it wasn't until August 22nd that I was notified, okay? And this is probably has to do with two things. I was new to the area, so they probably didn't know I was here. The time it took 
for them to actually confirm it was lacrosse virus and the time for people to get their ducks in a row um, for things to happen. And so the CDC tasked me, they actually just asked, they said, you know, we don't have money for this. Can you go and try to confirm that there's mosquitoes with lacrosse virus in the area? And I said, yes. So on the September 5th, 2012, within 15 days, I was able to find 49 sites around this child's home um, to look for mosquitoes. This was 62 days after he was potentially bit and 57 days after presentation. The odds of me finding an infected mosquito were very, very low. This is two to three generations after it would have happened. But this again wouldn't have been possible without the community. So Google Maps may or may not be my best and worst friend. Um, I did a cemetery search around his house and found roughly 40 to 60 cemeteries all within 10 radial miles of his house. Um, which meant I had to go to all these sites and check them out. I didn't have the personnel to really do this because we had committed to other projects at the time. Um, so I contacted UT Extension, Sharon Perrin with Union County. She helped me a ton to find these sites. Um, and I'm really lucky that my in-laws live close by. And so they spent their Labor Day weekend with me driving around Union County, Granger County, um, and I forget the third county at this time, um, looking for sites where mosquitoes can be. Because it's really hard to drive and take notes at the same time. It's just not safe. <laughs> they were great at that. <laughs> and what were you looking for cemetery? We'll get to that one in a second. So we got really lucky with 11 residencies. Sharon found us 11 homes and 38 cemeteries. Um, where we were able to do adult and immature collections. So why did I look at cemeteries? This is the cemetery at the front, the first slide. This is probably my favorite cemetery. It's really weird to have a favorite cemetery. Um, but it was my favorite cemetery because it was the first one we went to um, where we found things. Um, in the literature, cemeteries have been connected with Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, um, especially in, um, in Cuba. And so at cemeteries, there's a lot of squirrels and chipmunks running around and up and down trees. There's a lot of these vases. So these vases hold water. And I mean, it's, it, it's there for a really good thing. One of the things I've learned from looking at cemeteries is there's two types of vases. There's ones that hold water and there's other ones that have a hole drilled in them so the water just flows right out. And I'm like, those are the ones everybody should use. So I would totally push for that. Um, but here you can see just an image of me. Like, I'm just taking my cell phone and sticking it down into one of these um, vases right here. And you can see larvae and pupae just developing really nicely in, in, that, in that pot. There's a tree like right here. I don't know why I didn't take a picture of this tree, but we set a trap on it. So this is just a black stadium cup. Okay, really nice, just like this actually. I have one with me. And we put seed germination paper in here and mosquitoes lay their eggs on this. And here she is, Aedes triceriatus, laying her eggs at this site. I mean, it just, I was really excited about that. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's the small things that, you know, when, when science comes together. But then again, it's also um, wasn't just me being excited about that. Um, we were able to confirm lacrosse virus in the, in the child. So when you do genetic sequencing, you get a bunch of lineages back and, and genotypes back. And to just be really quick on it, um, three of the mosquito pools that we, we collected and tested um, were positive for lacrosse virus. And they were 98% genetically similar to this child um, back from 2012. And, there was a male pool and a female pool, so there was transovarial transmission occurring within those sites. And we got lucky because the cemeteries were the two sites that tested positive. So I'm one of those people who don't like data to just sit in a folder. Um, I want data to keep becoming data and results and moving to the next stage. So I went and I spoke with um, Agricola Adoy with the vet, veterinary medicine. He's a spatial epidemiologist. And I said, you know, I'm driving around and I notice patterns. I'm a scientist and this is what I see. And I said, can you show me clusters of where these mosquitoes are? And he was like, well, the stats will show you the clusters. You know, the stats don't lie. Um, but so what he found was that there was a cluster here of the Asian tiger mosquito, a cluster here of the Eastern tree hole mosquito, and a small cluster here of the Asian bush mosquito. But so then I said, all right, let's take these circles and overlap them and see what happens. And sure enough, when we overlapped these two, these two circles, what we found is that the eastern tree hole and Asian tiger mosquito population clusters overlapped in the same area where the child lived and where the pool mosquito pools were positive. 
So we were able to basically find it in a site, which had not been done before. So then, you know, this takes time to do all of this. So now it's roughly April of 2013, and we're talking about mosquito season and what we're going to be doing this year. And the health department says, you know, I, I can afford to get you guys an intern if you guys can go out in the field. And so I had a, a student who had been interested in working with me. I didn't have funds at the time, um, but she moved within two weeks from Massachusetts to, to work on this project. So this is Cassie, and she did this internship where she compared trapping methods for mosquitoes. And so she can, so mosquitoes do different things. They don't just fly around and bite you, okay? Like, I promise you they do other things. So if they're trying to bite you, they call, we call them host seeking. We compared these three different traps here. So in this cooler is dry ice. And when dry ice sublimates, it becomes carbon dioxide. And so we drilled holes in these coolers that we bought at Walmart. And the dry ice, the, the CO2 was coming out. And the mosquitoes like, all right, there's a human here. But there's a fan right here. And it just sucks them down. And then we can come back and, and take them into the lab and, and test them. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, so we compared that. And then um, the researchers who've been working on yellow fever in Aedes aegypti, and really in dinghy, um, developed this lure, and this lure um, is really similar to um, human skin, and so we decided to test that out. Um, this trap is heavy, bulky, I would argue it's dangerous because we're carrying a CO2 tank with us too, um, but people like it, so I said, okay, we'll evaluate that one. So the mosquito comes to the, um, basically the CO2 that's right here, and then gets sucked down into this, this collection head too. So after, and so those are all called host-seeking traps, okay? So after a mosquito feeds on you, it gets full, okay? And when we get full, we typically like to rest. And so we have another trap that we call resting traps. So when mosquitoes rest, they typically, you know, at my house, we'll go kind of underneath a patio, near dark vegetation somewhere. And so here is just like a pot that we have. And so the mosquito is supposed to come in here and rest and then get sucked into this net. So we can collect those that had just recently had a blood meal. After she has a blood meal, she then, um, she takes that blood and uses that, the protein from the blood to develop her eggs, okay? So that's why females need to blood feed. So after she does that, she's ready to go and lay her eggs. So we use these traps called gravid traps to collect gravid mosquitoes or those that have a bunch of eggs in them. So this is just like stinky tree hole water is the best way to probably describe it. Mm -hmm. And the little female, and she's, you know, I don't want to call her pregnant, but she's gravid and she's getting ready to lay her eggs in here. And then this fan sucks her up in here and she's like, she's trapped in there is basically the right way. So, <laughs> so Cassie evaluated all these different traps. At um, sites, these red dots were sites that were previously positive for lacrosse. Not the sites themselves, but a, a patient was positive with lacrosse. So we assumed that the mosquitoes there were positive too. And then again, the community, I was just started putting out like Facebook requests. Like, does anybody live in this area? Can I trap mosquitoes at your house? Three people said, sure, you know, like why not? Um, so we came and trapped mosquitoes at their houses. And so these grabs are really hard to see, but you see stars there, I hope, from the back. Um, and basically what this says is that these mosquitoes were collected best with different types of traps. So this trap here that had the human lure kind of attached to it was great for the Asian tiger mosquito. All three of these traps that tried to collect those mosquitoes that were getting ready to bite you, the host seeking, were great for the um, eastern tree hole mosquito. But the only trap that worked well for this one um, was the gravid trap. So we can only really collect this mosquito after it's had a blood meal, after it's rest, and, and then once it's getting ready to lay eggs. And so, you know, when I talk with Knox County Health Department and what we need to do for lacrosse, you know, it's really about improving vector surveillance. So we can use this trap, these two traps, to get these two mosquitoes, but we have to use this trap to get this one. You know, really the literature has been, I don't want to say ignoring this, but this, this mosquito has been hard to find. We can catch it after it's had the blood meal and rested, but we're having a really hard time catching it on the fly, so to speak. <coughs> yeah, so then, so then something great happened and Cassie was able to become um, a master student in my program. And so she published her work um, on that and then we started going deeper into the questions. And so when I talk with the community, I can use words like diurnal and crepuscular and nocturnal. Exactly, and that's what I get. So if I talk to the community and I'm like, all right, these mosquitoes are crepuscular, that means that they like to bite around 
just before twilight and just after dusk and dawn, right? So these are time periods that don't translate well. And so Cassie and I sat down and said, what can we do that is translatable? And so for me, I have a very tight schedule. Um, the nine to five makes sense to everybody. And so Cassie went out and set up her traps, um, all three of those traps again, at different locations around Knox County. Um, but she would go back to those traps and change out the nets on a regular basis, basically before and after five was the goal that we were looking for. And sure enough, she found that they were basically active throughout her entire sampling period, but significantly more of these mosquitoes were collected after 5 p.m. So now I can tell the public, when you get home from work or after 5 p.m., which either one it is because not everybody works the 9 to 5 shift, um, that's the time you need to be protecting your kids, right? So this isn't, this is the time you need to be protecting yourself. This is the time you need to be protecting your kids from these mosquito bites. Um, this information has actually been a whole lot more useful than I really thought it was going to be and that we can we can tell people when to avoid mosquito bites we can tell them when to put treatments on or when treatment should occur and also knowing this can help minimize non-target effects if you guys remember the unfortunate event in South Carolina where mosquito control operators went out and they sprayed an area um, in hopes of preventing Zika mosquitoes, um, for lack of another word, um, from establishing, they accidentally killed an, a, a very large bee population in that spot. So it was, this was not good, okay? This is one of those moments where we were just like, okay, two steps back. How can we relook at this? If we know that these mosquitoes are active after 5 p.m., that's when we should be treating. That's when Knox County Health Department treats. That's why they say stay in, you know, when they do their treatments, they're gonna be doing it a much later than that, but they're targeting a different mosquito group too. Um, but bees are active during the day. And so we have an opportunity now to separate out our treatments from our, our non-target effects. I was really, really excited when we were able to figure that out. <laughs> the other thing that Cassie did, um, you know, it takes a long time to screen a mosquito um, to, to figure out what's positive and what's negative. And it's not just time, it's money too, okay? So the cost for screening have, are, is very expensive. And so what Cassie was able to do is we teamed up with um, Dr. D'Souza in food science over on, on, um, on UTIA. And what they do in food science is they have basically kits or tests that they can test vegetables not veg like vegetables for salmonella and campylobacter and I said hey can we flip this instead of doing this for foodborne pathogens which is equally important can we do this for um, this mosquito borne virus and sure enough she was like yeah we can do this and she's a very positive person so that helps too and you can sort of see here um, that Cassie was able to do this she developed um, a method called RT lamp which is significantly cheaper and easier to use for detecting lacrosse virus within the mosquitoes and so basically what it is is you get a tube you add your mosquito um, RNA to it and potentially any um, virus RNA to it you add reagents to it you shake it up you can put it in a hot water bath so we've completely eliminated a machine that's twenty thousand dollars this is the most expensive water bath we could find on Amazon, so that's why it's a thousand. Um, wait an hour and a half, pull it out, you shake it, it's cloudy, it's positive, it's clear, it's negative. You don't even have to run a gel, but we're used to running gels, so we do gels. What are you actually for? For the virus, for the actual virus. So we have now a new method for identifying the virus in mosquitoes. So I will say this has not been published yet because we're waiting for a field validation study. <coughs> I'm sorry? How long was it? Did it take to About an hour and a half. Yeah. And that's just sitting in a hot water bath. So this is something that we can do now in county health departments who can't afford the $25,000 machine. The cheapest. That's the cheapest and that's the most expensive. So the other thing that we've been looking at is these mosquitoes tend to... We, don't know, we didn't know if they would tend to lay their eggs together, okay? So we wanted to look for co-occurrence of these mosquitoes. We knew that, you know, we'd caught them and, and you know, kind of scooped them out so you can get like a, like a turkey baster and you can just, actually turkey basters are really great for mosquito <laughs> collection. <laughs> you just can stick it in there, suck it out, and there's your larvae and there's your water and you can just kind of go on for the next day. Um, but we knew we could get larvae out of there, but we didn't know like if the females mosquitoes were actually ovipositing or laying their eggs together. 
And so Drew and a few other undergraduates, but Drew, um, Drew Dixon did a lot of this work um, with help from the Knox County Health Department on this. He looked at these cups all around Knox County um, and found that some cups had no eggs in it. Some cups had one species, the Asian tiger mosquito. The other one only had eastern tree hole mosquitoes. And some of them had both uh, mosquitoes um, present in it. And so stopping here is, is fine. But you know we need to throw some statistics next to it to show that, that it's important. And so if you can make one of these nice kind of like high square tests where you have cups where they're both present and cups where they're both absent, and then compare them from there. And then you can do what we call Cole's Cole's coefficient of association, where you can try to find a reason why they're together. And so kind of to just describe really quickly this coefficient, zero is neutral. They're just randomly found together in space and time. If it's a positive one, it means they want to be together. They're like mosquito besties, OK? Like they're always going to be going to the same cup at the same time, OK? If it's a negative one, th they don't want to be together, OK? So they're repulsed. I don't want to say repulsed, but they, they're just not going to lay their eggs together, OK? So here we got this 0.17, and I was like, eh, that's not really fantastic. But it was statistically significant, and it helped us basically indicate that approximately 17% um, of the total possible positive association was observed here. And to just kind of give you an idea, this is what Drew did. Like, he took eggs under a microscope and could ID these two species. I mean, that's, oh, wow. yeah, he, great student. I've really been very, very lucky with, with who I've been working with. Um, the other thing that Drew and the few of the other undergrads found was that oviposition varied across the landscape. Okay? So all of these are Knox County Health Department sites. So what would happen is um, Nathan would go out and set up for West Nile virus monitoring. We would give him stuff and he would just do this stuff with us. And then on, you know, he'd come back, give them to Drew. Drew would ID them and count them. But when we looked at this, you know, aggregate it all together, what you can hopefully kind of see is that there's different pie charts. And so if you see like an all orange, that's a site where only the Asian tiger mosquito was collected. But if you see all blue, that's a site where only the eastern tree hole mosquito was collected. But you can see that there's some variation across the landscape. And this variation wasn't true just across the landscape, but we saw this across time. And so this was just, again, a really nice collaboration between the, the two different groups, where if you have on the x-axis the, the time, um, and then the back transferred means, sorry, that's really wordy, um, but basically egg counts on the y-axis, you can see that the eastern tree hole mosquito is very active early on, and then later on, um, the Asian tiger mosquito becomes more, more active, ovipositing and laying eggs. Because Drew is, is a great undergraduate student, um, he was able to also get a bunch of temperature data and precipitation data and kind of line these up together. And this is really hard to see, but you can kind of maybe see something out of it or try to see something where you have temperature as it increases, the mosquito population increases, then you see this decrease and then kind of these like peaks and valleys. And then you can see that these darker bars are precipitation. And basically if you have precipitation here, Roughly a few weeks later, we have more eggs being laid. Okay, so this has me thinking: How do we? How can we use this data to our advantage? There are some brilliant people on this campus <laughs> who don't say no to me and probably should. So this is Suzanne Lightheart with uh, mathematics, and this is James Nance. He's um, over at, at Emory now. Um, and I said, you know, I have some really great data. Is there a way we can model this so we can start predicting when mosquitoes are going to be coming out and biting? And then eventually, so not now, eventually can we create potentially a forecasting system for when lacrosse virus infected mosquitoes are flying around? That's the, that's the, the 10, 15 year goal where I'm going with this. So they built an ordinary differential equation model for the Asian tiger mosquito using CASI's 2013 data. So this, these are the colors that James chose. I did not choose these colors. Um, but kind of really quickly, so on the x-axis is the calendar week when Cassie was out in the field. On the top row are the number of mosquitoes that are out getting ready to bite. So those are all collected with the host-seeking traps. On the bottom are those mosquitoes that had just laid eggs. So those are all egg counts. On the left-hand side are temperature, and the right-hand side is precipitation. So just from eyeballing this, you can probably see a tight correlation here with temperature, a tight, temp a tight correlation here with temperature with the eggs. And then when you get to precipitation, you kind of, 
you see trends, but you're just like, oh, I can't really call that as significant yet, right? So that's where I'm at with this. James and Suzanne are awesome. So they built an ordinary differential equation, basically looking at the entire life cycle of age, the Asian tiger mosquito in Knox County during that one season. So eggs, the immature stages, the host-seeking adults, and then the gravid adults, that some will die and then some will come back and become host-seeking adults again. These gravid mosquitoes will then loop back and lay eggs and some will die. So there's a bunch of different variables associated in here, a bunch of different rates of change associated in here. And so my question was, can we link this to temperature to precipitation and then to change in temperature. So that kind of that derivative, right? So if it's 60 degrees today and 70 degrees tomorrow and then 60 degrees again, that fluctuation, okay? So this is the model they ended up building and I, I will say it's fitted specifically for the host-seeking mosquitoes. And you can see it's, it's pretty darn close, okay? So this is the equation where the mosquitoes, are, so the red line are, is our data set. Okay. The blue line is the model. So you can see it, it's fairly close. <coughs> I know, I was, I was excited. I'm, not, I'm very biased, though, to my, my research. Um, so then you have to test, well, you don't have to, but you should test for sensitivity to see which variables are most important. And here we found that in this model, temperature, the minimum temperature, is really, really important. And this isn't just important for our system. We're seeing this now with the Asian tiger mosquito across the entire landscape where when I was talking to somebody in Connecticut, they now have overwintering. So mosquitoes that are making it up in Connecticut now. Temperatures are changing, mosquitoes are making it up a bit north. But then it again, all goes back to the cases of lacrosse. So in 2013, we had a number of lacrosse cases in Knox County alone, okay? We had quite a few. And so again, the calendar week, the model of this, the host seeking, um, lined up against the number of lacrosse cases that we found in the area. So it's not a great fit yet. We're just beginning to build this. This is what I'm seeing is like, you know, I'd love to say my 2020 goal. Um, that's highly ambitious because it's 2018, but you know, maybe, maybe a bit later. So I'm just gonna summarize my research before I go into the next step of what I'd like to be doing. Um, so what we've been able to do in, in the past few years to increase the epidemiological understanding, and we've been able to improve surveillance efforts for prevention and control of lacrosse. You know, on the mosquito side of things, we were able to connect mosquitoes with a fatal case that had not been done before. Um, we identified sites and best trapping methods for surveillance. We discovered two species that were positively associated with one another. Um, we identified mosquito activity for prevention, not just the temporal activity of after 5 p.m., but that connection with the environment as well. On the lacrosse side of things, we were able to conform the impart Firm the importance of lineage one. I haven't really talked about that because I'm not a virologist, um, but know that when a virus gets into a mosquito, this mosquito's immune system is going to respond to that virus. And yes, mosquitoes have an immune system too. And it changes the genetics of that. So that, that virus has to survive. So there's genetic drift and genetic selection that occurs within the mosquito itself. The fact that we have three mosquitoes that are potential vectors is changing a lot of the, the viral genotypes. Um, we've developed an improved diagnostic method, and we've confirmed transavarial, the fact that the female can pass it to all of her, her children. So that then leads us to the next steps, which has been driving me crazy, I'm not going to lie, which is why Southern Appalachia, okay? Why and how will we prevent these cases? And so just to kind of go back to this first graph I showed you where Southern Appalachia has quite a few of the cases. Last year, we had 16 of the country's 26 cases just in Tennessee. Okay, so that didn't include North Carolina's cases. Knox, like, we had quite a few cases, all found within Eastern Tennessee. I don't know about you, but I, I, maybe I look too hard and, and try to find patterns when I shouldn't, but it does look like there's something really neat about our environment here. You know, something about the fact that we're so close to the Appalachian Mountains that we have the trees, that we have the squirrels, that we have the mosquitoes all right next to the area. And we also have this variation um, along an urban to, to rural gradient. And so Devin, my current master's student, is gonna be looking at this a lot closer by identifying factors associated with these mosquito populations. So he has a bunch of different types um, of sites across Knox County. And next year, he's gonna include more stuff in halls and over here. Um, but he'll be looking at 
quite a few different variables. So abiotic variables, biotic variables, socioeconomic data that could be incorporated with it, and then looking at the, um, the entomology side of things. So if you see these traps around Knox County, please leave them alone, um, is my next um, thing. Please don't, please don't call the bomb squad. This happened this past year. It's not a bomb. It's a mosquito trap that was properly labeled, I promise. Um, but so you'll see these black cups all over Knox County. Um, last year, I think he had 88 sites. Um, this year, he's hoping to, to do quite a bit more. These traps you'll find hanging in and around the trees kind of randomly. You can just look at them if you want, but please don't bother anybody else. Um, just some preliminary results from his data. If he's look, looking at just the egg data, so the eggs that were identified on the, the piece of paper collected in this one little cup at each site, you can see some eggs, some cups have three different species in it. Some only have one. So we're seeing again this variation. And then it's important to not just look at one life stage, right? We have to get both life stages. So when we look at the adults, and this again is just presence. This isn't quantity, this isn't anything else. He's you know, brand new master student. Um, we see a, a really good difference here with our data set, such that those mosquitoes that have maybe like three different species, you know, in these traps, we're only getting like one of the species. So again, confirming the importance of using multiple trapping methods. Um, we're hoping to get funding to also screen these mosquitoes to develop lacrosse virus risk maps. Right now we can develop um, 80s risk maps. So like where you're most likely to get bit um, across the area for Knox County. So how do we get rid of lacrosse virus in Southern Appalachia? Um, this is what um, the health commissioner says. Um, wear insect repellent, wear long, loose, and light clothing, um, wear permethrin on your clothes. I hate to say it, but I'm beginning, I don't, I don't wanna be a pessimist, I'm an optimist, okay? But this, this isn't either working or there's another reason. There's a behavioral reason, and so I'm hoping to start working with some social scientists to figure out either why people aren't using these things or we need to start thinking differently. The other thing that we know about mosquitoes is they're very small, they're very light, they're very delicate. And I have some here at the end that we can look at. They don't fly very far. Okay, so these mosquitoes typically don't fly more than a football field or two, okay? The catch is here in the area, we have a lot of habitats, okay? <laughs> and that, that is the problem. Um, so how do we get rid of these? Um, and this is where I need your help. Okay, I can't do this alone. I'm, I'm a two-person show. Um, basically, I need community involvement and we need to try something different. And so ideally, once we develop these risk maps for where um, the different mosquitoes are, we can start thinking a little outside the box. So when I was at Kentucky, um, there was a professor there who now has started a company called Mosquito Mate. And he's basically releasing mosquitoes in other locations and this is an EPA approved method for reducing the number of mosquitoes in an area. So there's two different ideas here. The first one is that lacrosse virus sites, can we use male mosquitoes dusted with an insecticide to kill the female mosquitoes in her offspring? So we know that if we have a mosquito and he's got insecticide on it and he goes off and his mission, right? His whole mission in life is to find a female mosquito. Like I've been trying to find, oops, sorry, to find a female mosquito, but this is like his mission, like his, his whole purpose. So he finds the male mosquito, he mates with her, and he transfers this insecticide to her. When she goes to lay her eggs, or, or their eggs might be the better phrase, um, she puts that insecticide into the water and thereby her offspring don't develop, okay? So we're using mosquitoes to kill other mosquitoes here. Can we use male mosquitoes with the bacteria to sterilize or the female mosquitoes. So mosquitoes don't mate very often. The, an old mosquito typically does transmission. They don't live to be a long time. Can we get in there to basically sterilize them? Or can we do something different like they're doing with dengue virus in other locations? Can we use Wolbachia to displace infected mosquitoes? You know, in the long term, I'd love to be able to identify the genetic mechanism for transviral transmission and then potentially use the new CRISPR technology to not make it happen, right? So we, we have there's ideas that are out there for other mosquito-borne problems. Why can't we use them here in, in East Tennessee? And then, of course, the ecology side of things, um, the roles of the hosts, um, the vectors, and the environment. Um, all of this kind of ties together for a few different things. And that's improving. So, so far, we've improved um, and made surveillance accessible. We've made it cheaper. That's a huge thing. Our county health departments are working on a very limited budget. I'm working on a very limited budget. We, 
I mean, I'm an entomologist. It's redundant to say that I'm cheap. Um, we've increased the research potential now extremely far so that we can go up to Connecticut now and we can give them some of our materials and they can start working you know, on you know, the Asian tiger mosquito and their potential cases of lacrosse in the future. Um, I've been working really hard to maximize methods and sites. I have a partnership with the USDA who've developed curriculum for working with schools and teaching, teaching teachers to teach the students biology, entomology, math, and all of these other fields that are integrated with one another. And ultimately, you know, this is what it all boils down to, right? Like why we kind of get up. Um, this is the child that passed away and got the project started. This is Leah. She was the fifth fatality from La Crosse. Um, she died, I can't remember if it was Indiana or Illinois, um, but I've been in contact with, with her family. So her dad emails me pretty regularly and, you know, says, how's the research going and all of this? And, and now I'm a mom of a monster. And so he fits the category of, of this. And so ideally we don't, we don't get there. How can we prevent it so that these things don't happen again? And obviously there's been a ton of work that's been done, not all by me. You know, I can come up with ideas, but these are like the true geniuses um, and, and the really the, the people who've worked really hard. And it has been a true academic and government partnership. With that, this is me out in the field, uh, my email, and I'm, I'm also on Twitter, so I'll be happy to take any questions. And I do actually want to do one other thing because I know this, this is live. If you go to the internet, which we go to, and you Google mosquito repellent and EPA, it takes you to this site eventually when you, if you look at the search image. And you can see that there's a bunch of different things that you can do for mosquito control. And we know these things on a regular basis, um, and I've talked about them. But if you scroll down, there's this site here called search for the repellent that is right for you. We as entomologists have recognized that people have this idea that, that DEET is not good for you. Um, so there's other things that are out there on the market too. Some of these things work, some of these things do not, and I have a, a bucket with me over here with all of this. So what's really awesome is you can go down here, and they now have this for ticks too. How much time will you need to be you know, protected from biting insects? If you're outside for just, you know, after dinner, so you're outside for just four hours, you can click on this and have a time. If you're out in the woods for 13 to 16 hours, there's an option there. I'm going to argue that most people spend four hours or less outside. I'd like to say that most people care about ticks, but well, since we're talking mosquitoes, we'll look for just mosquitoes here. Um, and then we'll just hit search, okay? And you can see there are a number of products that are out there on the market that we can use right now. Um, what is this? There's nine pages with 10 entries per page. For fun, we'll do 100. We won't look at them all. But what I want to show you is what this means, OK? So if this is the product, this here is the number of hours this works for mosquitoes. The next row is the number of hours it works for ticks and then the active ingredient. A lot of people use citronella, and there's nothing wrong with citronella, but it's important to know that it only works for an hour, and so reapplication is key, okay? Like, I cannot, oh, it doesn't, I won't say more, okay. But there's other things on here that work for two hours, um, like IR3535 and methadone and other, other products that are out there. It's not just DEET. Some DEET, how it's labeled and works. So this is, again, the CVS Insect Repellent Woodland Trail works for two hours. Other DEET, let's see. Yes, it's all about concentration and what you use. And so this website is supposed to be used, and I really want to push this in our area. So you can see some places are for three hours, four hours. Um, there's a bunch of different things. So, you know, some people might not like spraying, some people might like a wipe instead. Um, I have some things on here you guys can look at, but there are, there's things that are out there. There's no reason why people shouldn't be using something. I will say that there are some products that are not, have not been tested for kids under three. And so that um, IR353 is one of them, um, but just kind of keeping line on that, of what's good and what's bad. Or not as good might be the better word. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm right on time, sorry. The lacrosse mainly affected younger people. Is, yeah. that, is that generally true, or, or like is it, is it because of the 
because their immune system not uh, up to the same. So it will affect um, immunocompromised people. A majority of the cases are under 15. Um, I have not found in the literature why it affects kids more than adults. Um, I have a hypothesis that it has a lot to do with, with puberty and what happens um, at that time period because it does affect males more than females. And if you look at the age of when, so like it, it kind of like is equal in the beginning and then there's less females that are infected. And so I don't know if it's behavior or if it's immune system or if it's puberty. I mean, it could be lots of different things, but. It could be anything. Yeah, but I mean, I, I hate, I don't want to use the term that, you know, it's because boys are outside more often than girls because I was one of those girls who was clearly and stayed outside. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, those things that you put to float in a barrel or in a pond, do they work? Okay, so the, the dunks, the mosquito dunks, yes, they yeah. do work. Um, so that is a, a larvicide that when the mosquito feeds on it, it's not going to make it to adult. Um, depending upon the size, you might not need something as big. So we have a pond in our yard that's roughly the size of this table and that table combined. Mm -hmm. um, I'll buy one of those dunk. Well, you can't buy just one, but so like I'll get, you know, the six dunk pack. Mm -hmm take that dunk, break it in half, and break it again. So I put it into a quarter, yeah. and then I put that dunk in, and that's enough for that area. Do all four pieces in? No, I only put one of those four pieces. I think I, I probably only buy one a year. Else, I, have, I like to collect rainwater. Yeah. But some of them don't have any kind of screen on the top. And, and I so you, you can do that, yeah. Just, things like, like a quarter of one in each barrel. And that'll work perfectly. And, and it, it seemed to work pretty good. It, it's designed to do that. Um, the science behind it is is so neat that the fizzy properties and, and the things that are involved to get down to the right spots to where the mosquitoes are actually feeding. It's yeah. it's remarkable that that the industry has gone to that what extent. What does it do? Does it create some kind of film on the water or is it just a No, so it's something that they actually eat. There's a bacteria in there oh. that causes them to to not make it. <laughs> yeah. How much worse off would we be if we were rid of all mosquitoes? Oh. I mean, I can't argue for keeping mosquitoes. When you compare the, the costs and the benefits, you know, the, the true answer on that, we'd probably have more people, right? So mosquitoes work as a small population control. That's morbid and completely wrong to say, but that's all that they do, right? And so it's, and it's not even really the mosquitoes that are bad. It's the pathogens that have figured out how to use mosquitoes. And so when I talk about ticks, ticks aren't bad. It's the pathogens that I've used it. So no problem getting rid of them, in my opinion. What about the cup color? Seemed like maybe they're responsive to more to black cups than... Yeah, so they're definitely more... Or, or, or visual, or what, what was that? So, they're, um, so the literature definitely says to use a black cup instead of a white cup, but because we see them in other cups too, and we, we just wanted to play with that for fun. Um, it probably has to do with more of where, what it looks like. So it looks more like a tree hole. It's darker. It's likely warmer. Um, some of um, my collaborators at University of Maryland are looking at the leachate that's occurring. So like when tires and, and what's happening with that, with the mosquito community that comes out of it. Unfortunately, we're getting increased insecticide resistance due to those mosquitoes being put into those locations or growing out of those locations. Um, yeah. So. The black cup is more like their habitat. Um, we started using the white cup too because of um, Aedes japonicus, the Asian bush mosquito. Uh, my technician puts out a Cool Whip container for his cat, and it seemed like the reflectiveness of that. And so that's what we were hoping for on that, really, was to try to get that other mosquito. And that one is sneaky. <laughs> we haven't we haven't got there yet. We'll go here and then we'll come back. Yeah. No, um, and, I, and I didn't mention that. So the first thing, so I'm going to back up on that. Probably now that we know more about lacrosse, I think an ER um, doctor in East Tennessee at Children's Hospital is, is thinking lacrosse along with meningitis and herpes. So those are the three things that they think of. And so most of the time, um, these kids are misdiagnosed with one or the other um, before they're diagnosed with lacrosse. Um, I have, I, I'm going to be talking with the med school later on this year and hoping to get this out and that they call me sooner. Um, but there's a lot of misdiagnoses involved, especially if you're presenting at a place that might not have as up-to-date information. 
So one thing I, I don't like talking about is that this is a poverty-stricken area. People not, might not be able to afford to go to the hospital. People might not have the health insurance to do this. And so all of this really starts to add up. Yeah, it's just, it's a really sad situation that is preventable, which is the hardest part for me. Maybe one more question. What is the treatment for the Waiting it out is really it's kind of what it is. Yeah, and hoping that the immune system does its job. I mean, they'll be given, um, from my understanding, so I haven't, I haven't been there and I've been really fortunate to not experience it, um, is, is just, yeah, treating the symptoms, making the patient comfortable, giving them fluids, the, your normal virus response. Can you tell us what um, product you'd like to use? <laughs> I will show you. <laughs> no. So it varies, right? So it varies on what I'm going to do. So at my son's daycare, you know, they, they ask me all the time, like, which one should we use and not use? And I'm like, it depends on how long the kids are outside and if you're reapplying or not. So for me, I'll, I'll typically use DEET off family care. And I hate saying this because I sound like I'm plugging something. Um, but I like it. It works. Um, it's 15% DEET and it works for six hours. So in our neighborhood, we have trees everywhere. You know, my, my site is a field site, so I can't, I, we don't know yet if it's positive or not. Um, I, I suspect that we probably do have lacrosse in our neighborhood. Um, but yeah, this is what I use. And we're outside all the time. We're, out, we're outdoors people. Um, when my son was, was younger, we used these. And so you've probably seen these. Um, I kind of called it like the baby beeper is what we called it. And so it would go on his, um, his <laughs> it's really kind of funny, but it would go onto his diaper and he would kind of just crawl around outside with it. And <laughs> it created this like bubble around him, okay? And you know, I'm testing it, right? So I'm looking at it and like watching him and it's embarrassing that's even on, you know, online. Hope he doesn't watch this when he's older. Um, but, <laughs> but so like I'd see a mosquito kind of come in and get kind of, bothered by the, the bubble and it would like fly away and I was like oh this is working and the literature suggests it's working. The key thing is the hard thing which is remembering to turn it off and then turn it back on. So you know some people say oh it worked great one time and then it didn't work again and I'm like well did you turn it off after you used it and they're like no. <laughs> so, this is the off clip on. So um, the EPA site says it works for three hours. Um, it's advertised as 12 hours. Um, no, don't do it. It doesn't work at all. Is there any other that don't smell awful? Everybody's nose is different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 if I use like some of those things, if I, if I put that on, I have a migraine headache in 30 minutes. Right, and so there's, there's wipes too. So there's some stuff with wipes where you can actually put on um, and just oh. kind of treat it like as a baby wipe where you, where you put it on. Um, one of the key things with this is to think about your use of sunscreen too. So when I talk to when I talk to him at my son's daycare, it's like the sunscreen goes on first to protect the skin, the repellent goes on over it to stop the bite, and so that's that's the order of application. Because if you put the sunscreen on afterwards, you totally negate the effect of the of the repellent. Um, lemon eucalyptus it works for six hours. So yeah, like I don't like that. I, but there's other stuff that you know is advertised as natural and deep free. Um, protection for the entire family, but EPA does not recommend it. So it's not on their website. It's not there. I look at their active ingredients, and I'm skeptical. But yeah, yeah, and I, and I'm here. The like you guys can holler. I can stay late. It's fine. But we can stop. Yeah. You can stay for another moment yeah. if there are more questions. Yeah. We are very grateful to yeah. you. Yeah. No problem. And very grateful for the work that you do. Thank you. I like it. I also have a box of bugs if you guys want to see them because as an entomologist, one carries them all the time. <laughs>